Now, you know, David has eight brothers. You know, then there's David. David said this about himself in the, the book of Psalms. He said that he was conceived in sin. He was conceived in sin. What does that mean? Let me tell you, David was probably a love child of Jesse's. You know, it, it, you know, when they had the anointing, whenever the prophet came and said, oh my goodness, said, you know, God has said the next king is going to come out of your, your family, Jesse. One of your sons is going to be the king. So go get your boys. He said, I'm not even going to sit down. Go get your boys. And he brought the first one. Eliab was the first one. Big, tall, handsome. Man, he's a good looking boy. And the prophet Samuel said, no, it's not him. The next one, the next one, the next one. Now you got to realize, David didn't even get invited to the anointing party. How you know maybe, maybe Sister Jesse wanted David to be out with the sheep. Y'all understand what I'm saying? You know, God knows what's right and wrong. And I'm telling you, the most level playing field is right before the cross. Because I'm going to tell you, God doesn't care where you came from. He cares more about where you're going. And so the prophet said, no, it's not any of these boys. None of these boys. If you have another son, do you have a kid somewhere else? And he said, you disappointed if there was a big party at your house not just a big party, but an anointing party for the next king of Israel, and you had to keep the sheep, and you didn't even get invited to the party. I mean, they're fixing to eat. They're fixing to have a party. And the prophet said this. He said, go and fetch that young son. Go get that boy. He said, I'm not going to sit down until you get him. And when he saw him, he said, oh, my goodness. He said, that's him. That's him. That's, him. that's the one. God is going to anoint David and David is going to be the new king. Now, you know, the Bible talks about David, that David had a heart after God's heart. The only one that was ever said about David. And, you know, David certainly didn't begin easy. He didn't begin easy but, at all. But, but the way he finished, man, a lot. He was the only king to ever have peace on every border. David expanded the border, the north, south, east, and west. He was building the temple, the tabernacle, Solomon, his son. He gave the largest offering that was ever given in the history of the world. I mean, it's just, it's really, really amazing. But, but in David's life, just like in your life, just like in my life, guess what? Giants showed up. <laughs> giants showed up. Now, we talked about giants earlier when I'm preaching my series on the end times. Giants are a hybrid race. Out of Genesis 6, the, the fallen angels uh, had intercourse with women, and these men of renown were born. They were 10 feet tall. They were just, man, nobody had seen anything like it. And God said, let's just let those giants build the promised land, and then I'm going to give you all the land. How many of you know God can use even the giants in your life? Huh? Come on. God can, God's going to turn things around. And so there just happened to be these giants in the land. They hadn't all been wiped out yet. And, and it just so happens the Philistines are coming against Israel, which they repeatedly came against Israel. There was never, ever a giant that God ever showed favor for. There was never, ever a giant that ever loved God. And so they're coming against the Israelites, and, and Goliath is going out every day. He's talking smack in front of the armies. He's talking about how bad your God is, how awful you are, and how ugly you are. Let me just tell you, your enemy is going to be a trash talker. If you've got an enemy, your enemy is going to be a trash talker. You just have to understand that. Now, in 1 Samuel 17, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it. Jesse, David's brother, this is David's father, right after he's been anointed. He's already been anointed to be king. What's he doing? He's keeping the sheep again. <laughs> I mean, he's keeping the sheep. God has already anointed it. Some of you realize you've already been anointed, but you're still in your old place. Did you get it? You've already been anointed. You're still in your old place. So, so Jesse tells David, go down to the valley Elah where Israel is fighting the Philistines and take this food to your brothers and then carry to the captain these ten cheeses. It kind of sounds like bribery, doesn't it? I mean, you know, give the boss, man. Give him, tell him, you know, I sure do love him. Here's these extra cheeses for you. Give your brothers some bread and some old dry grain. Bring the cheese to the captain. So I don't know what to, to make out of that, but... David arose early in the morning, and he left the sheep with a keeper, and he took these things, and he went as Jesse commanded him, and he came to the camp of the army as they were going out and fight, and they were shouting for the battle. Now, there ain't no, there ain't no fighting going on. There's just a lot of shouting. How many of you know sometimes we get into shouting matches, but we don't back it up? 
Huh? I mean, they would dress in their full ba battle array. They'd get on top of this hill, and the Philistines get on it, and they'd just talk trash back and forth. It says, for Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array the army against army, but they're just talking smack. That's all they're doing. And so David greets his brothers, and when he greets his brothers, the champion of the Philistines comes out. His name is Goliath, and he begins to talk trash, and the men, men begin to get afraid, and they begin to draw back. Why? Because he's a giant. He's huge. And he's saying bad things about their God, bad things about their people. He said, haven't you got anybody in your little group of girls that'll come out here and fight me? And they begin to draw back. Now, Hebrews 10, 38 says, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, you know your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect. It's what you think with. Your soul is connected to your brain. Your spirit, man, is saved. God lives in your spirit. But let me tell you, your soul will mess you up. It will mess you. Why? Because it's going to think on everything negative, everything bad. And to the saving, how many of you realize I need my soul saved? But the thing is, you've got to get it saved every day because you're going to wake up tomorrow and have more stinking thinking. You're thinking like death. It's stinking thinking. And so they were drawn back. Why? Because remember what I told you, faith is not what you see. Faith is what you know. For we walk not by faith sight but by faith they looked at that giant you see your giants always look bigger than they actually are now he was big but in their eyes they were so big what did the what did the spies say when they came back said there's giants in the land and we're like grasshoppers before them man these guys looked absolutely huge but we're not like those who draw back because the king said this, the king said, whoever kills this giant, whoever takes the reproach off of Israel, he's going to be given a rich, rich reward. He's going to be given the king's daughters, his, her hand in marriage, and you're never, your whole family is never going to pay taxes again. You know, when you solve a king's problem, you get a king's reward. Amen. I'm going to say that again. I don't think you heard me. When you solve a king's problem, you get a king's reward. If you solve a pomper's problem, you're going to get a pomper's reward. You know, sometimes we have to know what battles we're fighting. You, you, do you get this? I mean, not, not every battle is worth, is worth fighting. And then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes the reproach away? And they tell him, You see, don't fight a battle that has no reward. Did you hear me? I mean, some people are just getting in fights, and why are you just getting in fights? Are you stupid? There's no reward for that fight. What are you doing, man? Come on, you can't die on every hill. There's some hills worth dying on, but it's not every hill. And so, you know, what are you doing? You, you realize that there's battles, but then there's also rewards. You know, anything that goes unrewarded in your life is eventually going to exit your life. That's the law of recognition. Anything that goes unrecognized goes unrewarded. When it's unrewarded long enough, it exits your life. Ask God to open up your eyes to the opportunities. Ask God to show you the true battles where there's a reward to be won. David said, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? Who is this guy? In other words, I want you to get this. David wasn't really asking who this guy was. He was asking, by whose authority does he operate? Whose authority? Where, where did this guy... See, they're looking at size. David's looking at authority. A big difference, see? With the eyes, he looks big. David's not looking at his eyes. David's not looking at his head. David's not looking at his sword. David's trying to figure out where does this man get his authority? How does he operate? You see, the armies already knew Goliath. Why? Because every morning he would walk down and he would mock them. He would taunt them. He would curse them. He would cuss. He had the foulest mouth. He would tell them in words that I wouldn't use this morning in front of you what he thought about them and how low they were. And they would listen to this over and over. And you know, every day he walked down, he probably grew an inch or two taller. That's what the giants will do in your life if you listen to them. 
if you look at them. I know some people, they're an expert in giants. They're going to Google every symptom they got. Man, I'm, you're going to have, you're going to be sick with stuff you don't even have. Man, when the doctor told me I had cancer, I didn't need to go Google it. I knew what cancer was. I knew what malignant melanoma was. I didn't need to look at the, the, the rate of, of living with it. I need to find out whose authority it was living by. Are y'all following me here? See, the armies, they already knew who Goliath was. He came out every day, and the Bible says in verse 28, now Eliab, his oldest brother, why is this significant? Because he was the oldest brother. Guess what? He's the one that should have been and could have been the next king over Israel. But God rejected him. He said, nope. Remember the first one, the prophet said, Woo, that's a handsome boy there. He's big, he's tall, he's handsome. Boy, he looks the part. He said, but God said no. So Eliab comes out, the one that should have been anointed, and said, why did you come down here, and with whom did you leave those few little sheep with in the wilderness? He said, I know your pride and insolence of your heart. You've come down here just to watch the battle, haven't you? Now, how many of you know and realize that when you're, you're at, at your attitude is right. You, you won't be pulled down to a lower altitude. David didn't even let this phase him. You know why? Because David came to bring the battle. Amen. He, he is the battle. He said, I didn't come to watch the battle. He said, man, I am the storm. I am the battle. How many of you got to realize you got to understand who you are in Christ? David was probably a bastard. David was conceived out of wedlock. We don't even know about his mom. We don't know. He said he was conceived in sin. We don't know what happened, but we know he's with Jesse. We know he's not with the family. We know he's out taking care of the sheep, which being a shepherd was a low-life job. That wasn't a high-life job. He didn't have a big position in the family. I don't even know if he stayed in the house. But I know that God had a house, God had a place, and God had a people for him. And so David didn't even pay any attention hardly to his brother. And he turned towards the other men and he said the same thing. Somebody tell me again, what does the guy get that kills that giant? How many of you know that just really flustered Eliab? You know, he's trying to tell, boy, did you come up here? What are you doing? You bringing the cheese? You little boy, you, you know, you little punk. And he turned around. He said, somebody tell me again, what does the man get that kills this giant? And so they repeated it to him again. And then the word begins to spread. Tell me again, who is this guy? And tell me, what do we get if we kill this guy? And the word begins to spread. And Saul, the king, hears of David from the army. This is how desperate they are. There's a teenager that has come in the camp, but none of our mighty men of war will go out and face the, the giant. But he hears there's a word, there's somebody in the camp that says he'll go and fight. So I don't know who he is, but bring him to me. And then when Saul saw him, Saul said, you're just a youth. He said, this man has been killing people from his youth up. Now, let me tell you, don't think it's strange when your enemy's against you, but don't think it's strange if your brother's against you. Don't think it's strange if the king is against you. I'm going to tell you, you don't need to make everybody happy. You just need to make the right one happy. Amen? If you are happy with God and he's happy with you, he's going to make a way that the king is going to see, the brother is going to see, your enemies are going to see. God's going to make a way in the wilderness where there seemed to be no wilderness at all, where there seemed to be no life at all, where there seemed to be nothing of promise. You know what the problem is? Is they just don't know you. They knew more about Goliath than they did about David. David's brother knew more about Goliath than he did about David. Had he have known David, he said, man, there's a spitball coming up here. My little brother, he's going to come up here. And I'm going to tell you, I know him. He's going to want to fight. I know him. He's killed a bear. He's killed a lion. He's going to want to go fight that. But, he, you know, instead they mocked him. They mocked him. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion and a bear came out and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and I struck it down. And I delivered the lamb out of its mouth. Your servants killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine 
This is speaking of authority, folks. This is speaking of authority. This uncircumcised Philistine, this man walks on false authority. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he defies the armies of the living God. Amen. Whose army are you with? The armies of the living God. They may have looked like chickens, but now a true king has come in their midst. Amen. How many of you know God will promote you out of nowhere? Amen. God will bring you before greatness. He'll bring you before people. He'll do it. That's what God does. And so something very interesting changes here. Because the king said, you cannot go fight this guy. You're just a kid. This guy's been killing people ever since he was a kid. This guy's a killer. You know, when I went to Mississippi, I never know how I'm going to get introduced. You know, I mean, these are my guys from Angola prison. They had life sentences. They got released on governor's pardons. It's just a miracle. I prophesied that the doors were going to be opening. And, you know, the doors opened. They didn't believe it. You know, I remember when I preached in front of them and they pulled me aside. Pastor, we don't get out of this prison. We die here. Nobody gets out. And now all these guys are getting out. Last week, I had another one of my friends get out, and Warden Kane hired him the next day. He's on his way to Mississippi to start his job in one of the prisons in Mississippi. I mean, God just does some neat things. But whenever I got introduced, George introduced me, and he said, you guys, he said, I'm going to tell you. He said, you've never met a man like Pastor Rusty. And so I'm like, man, where's this going to go? <laughs> And he fell back on the story with, with Freddie, and, and George shared that with some of the men upstairs. He said, man, he said, we had this guy, he's the most tor notorious hitman in all of New Orleans. He killed his first contract hit at age 11. Freddie's the guy that had all the bullet holes, 14 bullet holes in his chest. He was shot with an AR 14 times and survived it. He's out there on the yard without a shirt on because he's showing off all of his badges his marks of honor, his posse, his gang is with him. And man, I just, I heard the Holy Ghost. I just heard the Holy Ghost. I walked over there to him, and they're telling me, you cannot go over there. You cannot go over there. Pastor, this is not a good idea. This is going to end bad. And so I went over there, and even Rambo backed up when I started poking Freddy in his chest. I put my finger in every bullet hole, backed him up against the concrete wall, looked him dead square in the eyes, said, boy, if I would have shot you, you'd be dead now. I said, I carry a 45. I said, I want you to come to church tonight at 7 o'clock. <laughs> I didn't give him a chance to answer. I want you to come to church at 7. And, and they said, man, we were shaking our heads. We were like, call security. This is going to be bad. This is not going to be good. And Freddie said, I ain't going to no church. We think I go to church. You think I'm a church boy? I said, I understand, Freddie, I understand. I said, you're too scared to go to church, aren't you? He said, you think I'm scared? I said, look, Rambo, my body, bodyguard's right over here. I said, I'll get him to sit next to you, and he'll protect you. Guess who was on the front row at church at 7 o'clock that night? <laughs> Freddie was. Freddie sitting right in front of me, front row. I began to preach, and old Freddie starts to blubbering and sobbing and crying and weeping and slinging snot. I go to give the altar call. Freddie's hands, the first hand to go up in the air. I'm going to tell you, Freddie has never been the same ever since that. Freddie is the most famous, most liked, most called for referee. He refs basketball. He refs football. He refs everything. And if, if he makes a bad call, and I love this about Freddie... He makes a bad call. People don't argue a lot with Freddie. You understand that. Why? But if they do argue, this is what Freddie tells them. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I'm going to close my eyes and count to ten. And you better not be here when I open my eyes up. One, two, and three. And usually always when he gets to three, they're already gone. And he spins around and he starts walking off. That's Freddie. That's who Freddie is. How many of you know that if you walk in authority, you have authority over demons? You know, I was walking in what? I was walking in authority. Why? I had authority. Freddie had power. There's a difference. I'm going to teach you something about authority and power today. You would always rather walk in authority than have to walk in power. I'll explain that. It says, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. You see, remember, faith speaks those things that be not as though they were. It doesn't speak the things that are as though they were not. 
It speaks to things that be not. He's going to deliver me. God's going to deliver me from the hand of this Philistine because it certainly looked like this little boy didn't have any chance at all. But this is what authority does. Understand authority. Authority always brings peace. Write that down. Make sure you get this. Authority always brings peace. When you mess up, not if you mess up, when you mess up, where should you run? You should run to authority. Amen. How many mamas and daddies do we have in here? Uh, how many times would it be way better if when your kid messes up, not that you find out they mess up, not that you see that they mess up, but they come and they say, Mama, I'm sorry, I messed up. Man, it'd be a whole lot, it'd be a whole lot simpler, it'd be a whole lot easier, but no, you hide it and you try to keep it from authority. Let me tell you, authority is what brings peace into this world. We need to run to that authority. You see, notice later in the story when Saul was demonically oppressed and, and demons would, would just mess his life and mess his world up, who did he call upon? He called upon David. David brought his harp and he began to play and sing and the demons would flee. You see, David has an authority here. We're not talking about big muscles here. We're not talking about carrying a big sword. We're talking about an authority with the Lord, an authority. And so Saul says this. Why does he say this? Because I'm going to tell you, there's a peace that began to come into Saul's life. I'm going to tell you, why else would a king send a boy to go fight a giant? I mean, even if nobody else will fight him, you do realize Saul was the tallest and the biggest man in Israel. I mean, I'd go fight him myself. I can't, I can't send no girl out there. I can't send no little boy out there. I guess I'm going to go fight him myself. He might kill me. In fact, he probably will kill me, but, but I'm not sending no boy out there to do a man's job. But I'm going to tell you, David spoke with such what? Such authority. He said, look, man, I've killed a bear. I've killed a lion. He said, this uncircumcised Philistine, he's got no authority. He said, I'm with the armies of God. Man, God is inside of me. When I get on the backside of the mountain and I begin to pray, the Holy Ghost comes. Man, I'm just telling you right now, I'm going to go kill that giant. You know, sometimes what you need is you need the words of peace. But they have to be words of authority. Saul said, go and the Lord be with you. Go, and the Lord may be with you. You know, I flew out last Sunday, and I flew into Jackson, Mississippi, and I stayed in a hotel that night on, on purpose. Number one, I'd taught all week, the week before, every day, and been teaching, teaching. I was really tired. But I got in that hotel, and I just began to pray. I said, you know, Lord, I know that I'm fixing to go into a hell hole, and I know there's going to be a lot of demonic activity, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray, and I'm going to get ready. I'm going to pray. How many of you know that sometimes you need to get ready for the devil? You know he's there. I'm going to show up, and there's going to be hell that's going to break out. You know, so I'm going to pray. I'm going to get ready. We're walking through this part of the prison called Quick Beds, and I've just taken a few of the inmates with me. There's no security. There's no chaplains. I've taken a few of the inmates with me. We're walking through this place. It's called Quick Beds because they're there anywhere from two days to two months. They're classified. They're sent out. All of the gangs are together in the same place, which is not a good thing. And I'm walking through there, and this guy says, Hey, man, who are you? You walk with authority. And so I agreed with him. I said, That's right. <laughs> I said, Because I'm a man of authority. And he said, Well, I knew that you must be a big shot. And then I told him, I'm a pastor. This guy wasn't wearing a shirt. He had tattoos, literally, well, actually, he had tattoos in his hair, too. He was tattooed everywhere, everywhere, totally tattooed. And so I asked him, I said, which one of those tattoos do you least like? He said, every one of them. I said, those are all prison tats, aren't they? He said, I got every one of these in prison. He said, and now I'm back. This is my third time. He said, I need to change something about my life. And I said, man, I'm the guy. I'm the guy you need to see. I took his hands. Now, remember, this guy's a gang guy. I took his hands, and I prayed for him. He didn't care who was looking. He bowed his head. He thanked me. He thanked me. He thanked me. He thanked me. He said, I could tell you're a man of authority. How many of you know God gives you authority in this life? Amen. They see it in the prison. 
God gives you authority. We need authority. We need to walk with authority. Now notice, he didn't say, man, you look like a man of power. He didn't say it because I'm not a man of power, but I am a man of authority. I got the power if I need it, but let me tell you something about power. Power always brings pain. Authority brings peace. Power brings pain. We're walking in, going to this place, and Ronnie, who's a big, big boy, Ronnie was the head, the top in a gang. I don't understand all these tattoos, but he told me, he said, see these tattoos above my eye? And I said, yeah. He said, those aren't gang tattoos. Those are tattoos of authority. He said, I just want you to know that when I walk in here, there's going to be some people, because they haven't seen me, they're going to be afraid when they see my tattoos. Now, you see, Ronnie was walking with power. He was walking with some authority, but it was the wrong authority. I'm walking in, man, I ain't even got a tattoo, but I got some authority. You understand what I'm saying? God wants to give you authority. Ronnie said, I heard about you, and I heard that you don't need a bodyguard. I heard that you might be my bodyguard. And I said, well, Ronnie, I'm just going to tell you, like, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to go in there. I got no fear. And so we went in together. But you see, God gives power, but we have to first seek his authority. See, God will give you authority and power. He's not going to hold the power back. But the first thing you need to seek is you need to seek the authority of God. It says, so, so Saul clothed David with his own armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head and, and clothed him in a coat of mail. And David fastened Saul's sword to his armor and tried to walk, but he hadn't tested it. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these. I have not tested them. So David took them off. In other words, David was saying, I don't understand the authority of this. This is real powerful because you would think completely the opposite don't, don't get wrong here. Stay right. Stay with me. You know, we want everyone to look like us. So Saul's going to put, make him look like a king, make him look like something, put your coat, put your mail, put your armor, put your sword. We want everybody to look like us. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? I'm going to tell you, even, you know, we look for things, we look for people you know, you go into prison and, and you're looking for somebody that looks like you. You're looking for somebody. You know. God doesn't look at that. He hadn't tested. Verse 40 said, he chose for himself instead five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag. Why? Because he's a shepherd. Man, you don't take a shepherd's bag into, into battle. He, well, David did. And he had a sling that was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine and the Philistine came and began to draw near to David and then the man before the shield, the man, the giant has a man. His shield is so big, there's a man that just carries his shield for him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was only a boy, ruddy and, and good looking. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog? And you have come to me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. I mean, this guy is cursing like crazy. And see, we're talking authority here, not power. He, Goliath, has the wrong God. He is cursing David by his, you think you're God something? Let me tell you about this blankety blank God and who you are. What do you think? You a boy coming out here? Well, you think I'm a dog? You coming at me with sticks? Boy, I'm fixing to kill you. I'm fixing to take you down. And then he began to curse the God of Israel. And the Philistine said to David, come to me. He said, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, let me tell you, the devil talks trash. You go to your doctor and you get a bad report. I'm going to tell you, the devil talks trash. Whose report are you going to believe? Well, it's over for you, man. I can tell you right now, it's over. It's over. You know, when the doctor told me I had six to seven months to live, I'm going to be honest with you, I cried like a baby all the way home. But I didn't believe it was over. I said, I don't know what authority that doctor's got, but I know a little bit about authority. You see, let me, let me phrase it to you like this. Don't ever run at your giant with your mouth closed. Amen. I begin to, and you guys, and Ann, I don't know that Ann ever heard this. When I cursed the devil, I used every cuss word I knew. I'm talking real cuss words. 
I'm not talking, well, in the name of Jesus, I'm like, you blankety blank something or another, you're going to get out of my life right now. I bind you in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. You know, I mean, I was giving him everything I had. How many of you know authority makes a difference? See, David is giving it, the word of God, to this giant. He said, you might curse me. He said, let me tell you, I got something for you, buddy. I got something for you. Come on over here. And so this day, David said, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. He said, you're going to die today. This is a little boy. He's like, man, what do you, you think I'm a dog? You come at me with a stick? David said, I'm going to tell you what, buddy, I'm coming at you. But what I'm coming at you with is more powerful than all nine feet of you put together. How many of y'all are getting this this morning? I mean, come on, help me out a little bit. I'm preaching good right now. I'm going to tell you, you're going to come into a place in your life it's not if, it's when, when you better know the Lord and you better have the Lord and you better stand up and you better be ready to fight. But don't fight in your power, fight in your authority. Amen, it makes all the difference. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. This is authority David is speaking out of. That gang guy, he knows authority. He saw me walk in and said, man, who are you? You walk with authority. And then I told him I'm a pastor. And then he said, my life sucks, man. I, I'm in here again. He said, I got to change my life. Let me pray for you. I began to pray. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 47, it said, Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Did you hear what David just said? He said, so that all this assembly, so that all of you guys up there on the camp with the Philistines, so you'll all know this, God doesn't save with a sword and a spear. Well, well, I thought it was all about the sword and the spear. No, David didn't even have a sword. David went about, he didn't even have a sword. Saul was like, take this, man. You must take my sword. You must take my helmet. David said, no, sir, uh, the ba this battle is going to be the Lord's. He said, let me go get five smooth stones. Why did he get five? Because Goliath had four brothers. He got one for every brother. He said, I don't know how many of them's going to come at me, but I got something for them. I got a stone for them. And then this matter is like, what? What? What did he say? It's not with the sword or the spear. No, he said, I'm fighting with a different authority. You see, this is the Lord's battle. This isn't my battle. This is the Lord's battle. Now, let me, let me point out to you that any one of those Israeli guys in the army could have come down with the same authority and won the same battle, but they let fear motivate them. How many times does fear motivate us? I heard a bad word. Oh, the doctor told me something bad. Well, man, just buck up a little bit. Amen. Amen. Saying, I'm going to tell you, devil, I don't know whose authority you're coming, but I'm coming with the authority of the Lord. The battle is not mine. The battle is God's. God's going to fight this. So David, the Bible says in verse 50, prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. He killed him. He struck him. He went down. There's no sword. I love this. How many of you know that, the, that God can sometimes use the, the enemy's own work against them? What did David do after that? He went and he took the giant's sword. And he cut the giant's head off with his own sword. Good night. You got to be kidding me. And then you know what he did with the giant's head? He took it into Jerusalem with him. You know what he did with the sword and with his, all of his armor? David took that. As a matter of fact, as David grew up and got big enough, he, he used that sword. He swung that sword. That became his sword. You see, the very things that the devil comes to attack you with and attack you against are going to be the very same things God's going to show off in your life. 
Amen. Why do I talk about healing? Because I've been healed so many times. Why do I talk about miracles? Because I've seen so many miracles. Amen. I'm going to tell you, almost every prosperity preacher, they say, oh, God just preaches prosperity. You should have seen how poor he was when he started out. You see, whatever God gives to you, you're going to want to give to everybody else. Have you ever got anything from God? Huh? I'm going to tell you, sinners always like to share their junk. Christians don't share their junk. It's weird. We just want to keep it. I always use the, the biggest, the biggest idea is if I got a beer, you got a beer. Have a beer, man. You want a beer? You want a drink? Hey, come on. You want a drink? I'll get you a drink. If you got a Dr. Pepper, it's your Dr. Pepper. You ain't giving no Dr. Peppers. Man, I'd love to have a Dr. Pepper. Well, I'm sorry, but if it was beer, I'd give you one. But I ain't giving you one of my Dr. Peppers. It's the weirdest thing ever. Never seen anything. It's crazy. It's stupid. But you see, sin loves company. Misery loves company. And so Israel begins to chase these Philistines. I mean, they've done seeing their giant got whooped. Those four brothers didn't step down. They took off running, and Israel, then, then they, they kind of got in the spirit. Amen? How many of you know what I mean? They got in the spirit. They're like, they're running. Let me tell you something about running, is that you've got no armor on your back. You only got armor. So, man, they're running. They're giving us the blind side. that We can go kill them now. And they went and they killed these Philistines, and then I love it. Then they all came back and they looted the camp of the Philistines. They went through their tents and they pillaged. They took all of the worth, all of the value. But let me tell you, the, the Bible says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Did you hear me? I'm going to tell you, God wants to bless you, and you don't know where that next blessing may come. I walked into the infirmary. Now, I've never, I've never been in this prison. This is the first time ever. So I didn't know what I was walking into. I just walked in. You know, I'd already prayed. I'd already prayed up. I'm ready, you know, for the devil. I'm ready, you know, in quick beds. I'm ready for gangs. I'm ready. You say, well, how dangerous is it? Well, the commissioner over the state, he had so many death threats on his life. He lives in the prison now. There's two gates you got to get through to get to him. The head guy over operations, he lives in the prison. He's a special ops guy, and he basically doesn't have any rules, but he's a special ops investigator, uh, really special, special stuff. And what he does with gangs, you know, there's a, there's a real threat. And so, you know, I'm praying, and I'm just believing, man. I'm walking in. Ann gave me a theme song. I got a theme song now. I have to play it for you sometime. I'm playing my theme song. Man, I'm ready. I'm fixing to go stick it to the devil. <laughs> I mean, that's my mind, my attitude. And so I walk in the infirmary. I've never been there before. I walk in the door, and everybody did this. I'm like, I don't even know what in the world are they doing. Everybody's pointing. I looked over there where they're pointing, and there's this guy. He's all handcuffed up. His head's like this. He's grilling and making noises, and he's not making sense. And, and then one nurse, one nurse said, pray for him. I'm like, dude, this is a setup here. I mean, goodness sakes. I couldn't ask for a more sweet deal than that. And so I go to walk over to pray for the guy, and one of my students, one of my guys that's with me, he just kind of goes over there real fast and puts his hand on him and starts praying. I'm like, well, I'm impressed. That's awesome, you know. But let's see what happens. And he prayed, and nothing happened at all. And this guy had a big old split right down the middle of his head, and he was all stapled together, and he, he couldn't make any sense I couldn't he couldn't say words and so I knew well this is stinking devil this is just a demonic attack on this guy so I took my hand and I put it right on top of his head right on top of all those staples and just so he would know that a man got a hold of him I squeezed his melon pretty hard he knew somebody had him and I began to pray now I wasn't praying for this guy I was praying and rebuking the demons that was in him and I thought, good Lord, what if these demons start manifesting all over the place and people are going to be running out of here and all kinds of stuff. I said, Lord, just help me here. So you foul spirits, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over every one of you. And I command you to go from this man. I command you to let him loose. I began to pray. And remember, he was all, he's all shackled up. He can't get his head up and he's, just kind of gargling and dripping stuff and 
man, I just felt his body just start to straighten up and get all right, and he's sitting there. And when I said amen, I took my hand off of him, and he looked up at me, and this is what he said. He said, thank you, sir. I was so tormented. Thank you. And I said, well, you're free now. Be free. Be free. And so, remember, I've never been to this place before, and so I thought this would be a good time to exit. <laughs> Nobody's saying a word in the whole place. They're all just like this. And I just turned around and walked out the door. <laughs> I'm just like, I bet when I come back next time, they'll, they'll at least ask me what my name is, you know. Was, who is that guy? You see, walk with authority. God wants to give you authority. And authority brings peace. Power brings pain. But when you reject authority, you get pain. You know, prison's a miracle. All of those guys, what they did is they all rejected authority. And now they got pain. What kind of pain? They're locked up. If you reject authority in your life, I, I promise you there's going to be pain. When Jesus is coming back, the book of Revelations isn't about the end times. People read it about the end times. No, it's the revelation of Jesus. You've never seen Jesus come back with pain. He isn't coming back with grace. He's the same God, but now he's, he's shown us his authority. Now he's coming back with his power, and everyone that rejected his authority is going to get to taste his power. Are, are you all getting this? See, authority and power. Those that can't live under authority get to see pain. That's confinement. That's doing things that you didn't think you would ever do. Things you said you would never do. And here you are doing them. But there's power. There's power, number one, in the name of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the resurrection of Jesus. There's power in all of these things. But what authority doesn't do, pain will do. You know, the, the psychologists tell us pain is our greatest motivator. It's not a good motivator, though. If you can't get it right, and you have to learn by experience, how many of you know experience is costly? I mean, come on, you know, learn the first time. When you ran from authority the first time, learn. You know, I got stopped here at DPS. It's been a year and a half ago. I was doing 94 and a 55. I know I shouldn't have been. I didn't even wait for the lights to come on. I just I pulled over. Dude got me, man. I mean, what am I, I passed him on a hill doing 94. I saw his tail lights. He was hitting his brakes as fast as he could. I just pulled over. I got a ticket, but I asked for mercy, and the judge gave me mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is what you don't deserve. The judge couldn't get over it. So you're telling me you're guilty. Yes, sir. You're not telling me that the, the speed, the radar was faulty. No, sir. I might have been going faster. Because he caught me right on the top of the hill. So I might actually slow down a little bit. But you see, what did I do? I ran to authority. He said, well, I can't do anything about this. I don't even have your ticket. I said, no, judge, you don't have my ticket. It just happened yesterday. I'm coming to you. And what I want is I want a time and an appointment with you because I'm going to get dressed up and I'm going to put on nice clothes and I'm going to come see you because you're the judge and I'm going to plead my case. So what is your case? Mercy, because I was guilty. Man, he was really trying to, he was new to the job. And I didn't know him. He's way up. Commissioner Wren knows him because they have an office near each other. <laughs> I didn't know him, but Commissioner Wren knew him. I'm going to go see that man, and I'm going to plead for mercy. You see, what I was doing is I was trying to escape the pain and plead for the mercy because authority brings peace and it brings mercy. We've been given two great endowments, the Bible says. I'm going to close with this. We've been given the keys of the kingdom. Amen? That's pretty powerful. And we've been given the power, Jesus said, to bind and to loose. What did I do? I bound the devils and I loosed the life of God. When I had cancer, I bound cancer and I loosed life. 
In the name of Jesus, I thank you for the life that you've given me. I thank you, Father, that you're my healer. You're the Alpha and Omega. By your stripes, I've been healed. And that cancer has to go in Jesus' name. And I would cuss that cancer and command every cell in my body. How often did you do that? Every single day. When I was paralyzed, I would look at my feet and I would speak, feet, you're going to move. You're going to wiggle. When they said I wouldn't use my hands, hands, there's authority in this room. There's authority to heal in this room. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Hands, you're going to move. Fingers, you're going to move. And as soon as I could move them, I told the whole hospital, come in here and watch me move my fingers. God will do it for you. Authority. What is authority? Authority is something that someone else gives you. You don't have any authority. I got no authority. What, am I going to walk in prison with my authority? I get beat up. But you see, I walk in prison with the authority of God the Father. I walk into prison with the authority of the commissioner who's over the whole state. I walk in under the authority of the superintendent. Man, I got authority. I get to do and go where I want to go. I get to do what I want to do. Why? Because I'm asking the Holy Ghost. Only one time ever did I ever, ever, ever have to use my card. Security said, you can't do that. And I said, you know, it's okay. Believe me, it's fine. Don't worry. And they said, no, you can't do that. And so this is where authority came in. I pulled my phone out and I said, let me call Warden Kane right now and let you talk to him. You know the warden? I said, yeah, I just had supper with him. Let me just call him real quick. Oh, no, sir. You don't need to call the warden. You're good. <laughs> You're good to go. Everything's fine. How many of you know when you say, excuse me, wait a minute, devil. Uh, let me call Jesus real quick. Let me call Jesus. The devil says, oh, you know Jesus? I said, yes, sir. I got him right here on the speed dial. <laughs> That's how you use authority. How many of you believe today that the Lord loves you and the Lord wants to come into your heart and he wants to come into your life so that he can show off inside of you? I totally believe that. In Acts, there was a group of vagabond Jews. They were exorcists and Paul had been casting these demons out and they tried to cast some out. You see, when you go to third world countries, when you go to prisons, the devil doesn't hide. He doesn't have to hide. Here he hides, man. The devil's always hiding. Let me tell you something about the devil. He ain't going to show up on your porch with a pitchfork and horns. He's going to show up as an angel of light to deceive you. And they say, we cast you out. We command you to go by that God that Paul preaches, that one Jesus. And you know what them devils did? They said, Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are you? See, weren't walk, walking in authority. And so those devils, those demons inside of that man, they, they beat him up and they stripped him and they humiliated him. They pulled all his clothes off and he ran out of the place naked. That's what the devil wants to do is he wants to humiliate you. He wants to defeat you. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly.